Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the LawCast. This time, we're going back to cover the beginning of a new era for WCW. It's Halloween Havoc 1999, and it's Vince Russo's first pay-per-view as WCW's head writer. But first, I feel like we've got to pause for a second and travel back to the future and talk about this last week that was in wrestling. I mean, this is... Is it hyperbolous to say it's maybe the biggest week in the history of American pro wrestling? Is that too much? It's I don't know if it's bigger. The one the thing I go back to is um, the week the the last week of March uh, 2001 when the WWF bought WCW and then put on WrestleMania 17. It's hard to top that, but I think this was the biggest week we've had since then. Yeah, and I mean it almost feels like an unpausing like. That all of the years since that moment have just been, like, us just waiting for this moment to finally happen. To, like, the real and actual competitive war to start again. And it's not just that AEW launched successfully. It's not just that NXT finally gets a show. It's not just that SmackDown is finally on an actual network and the first time any wrestling real episodic show has ever been. But, like, all these other fucking promotions are doing great, too. Like, the explosion of quality wrestling is unlike anything we've ever seen. Yeah, so to establish exactly where we are, we're recording this um, like kind of late Wednesday night, uh, Wednesday the 9th. So like AEW wrapped about a half hour ago. I don't think either of us, I, I only saw a little bit of the show, so I'm not going to comment on what happened. I don't think you saw much of it either, right? No, I just, I know about the Jericho promo. I know about the private party match, and that's pretty much it. So those apparently were two gigantic, like, knockout punches. Yeah. So that's kind of, we'll cover up to this point. I guess let's just kind of go chronologically and start with the season premiere of Monday Night Raw. What uh, were your thoughts on the new set, the new commentary team, and the Bobby Lashley cuckolding angle? Okay. We're not going to do, like, fucking two hours on this let, let, let's just be very clear off the top but just very quickly the set is amazing fantastic oh, beautiful you like it i don't like it i love it it's, i don't like screens i need a more physical element to my set i like the smackdown set a lot more because it's got the like pillar thing is see here's what i like is well i guess that's true like uh, the raw set is good the smackdown set is great i the do SmackDown really like set, uh, the SmackDown set does this great thing where when the cameras get up into the entrance, it feels kind of closed in and intimate, almost like a smaller arena feel. And I, like, like, I, like the, I like the aspect of, like, they're coming through the tunnel like a yeah. football team. Yeah, that's very cool. The Raw set, though, it's still an improvement over what it's been before, which was I couldn't even – even right now, I couldn't tell you what the set was before. It had no personality whatsoever. Um, the – that sounds like the commentary team on Raw. Who the fuck made the decision to make Jerry Lawler the play-by-play announcer of Monday Night Raw? Was he just, like, filling in because the actual play-by-play guy couldn't put words together? I can't tell. Like, Vic Joseph is a very good play-by-play announcer, but he's never done it on the scale. I felt like he kind of gained confidence as the night went on, but it was pretty rough at the beginning. And these to have two like brand new wet behind the ears announcers on at the same time. And I'm sure they're getting yelled at by Vince for everything they say and don't say. I'm sure Lawler to some extent was just felt was the one of the three that felt the freest to just say whatever. Because whatever, Jerry Lawler say whatever he wants. Yeah, I think Lawler's just there because he's reliable. They know he can do the job that they're asking him to do. Hopefully the plan is to eventually get rid of Lawler and just go to Vic Joseph and Dio. And I think that they have the right mix. Like, Vic Joseph is just, like, somebody hatched a Michael Cole egg and a new Michael Cole has appeared. Like, that's just the mold that he is. Dio is very interesting and, like, has an interesting, like, viewpoint that nobody has really ever had at the announcing booth before. So, like, I hope that in, as a future announce team that can be something that works. Right now, though, it, they're so – they pulled them out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, So we are both pretty unabashed Bobby Lashley marks. What do you think of Bobby Lashley and Lana together? I uh, popped pretty hard for that, but at the same time, I start to question why every single storyline on Raw is based around Cuckin. Paul Heyman, are you okay? 
Did someone hurt what's, you? What's going on, Paul? What Gosh. are you? What's what's going on with you and your wife? I mean, fuck, man. Like, look, I loved it so much. Like, as somebody who just like Bobby Lashley never gets to do anything cool, never gets to do anything fun, always gets his storylines like shuttered for no reason. To see him like, yep, who's fucking Rusev's wife? Bobby Lashley. It was a this victorious guy. moment. Yeah. Um, overall, I did not think it was a particularly great episode of Raw, but that was a pretty strong angle to close things out. Yeah, it in no way felt like a season premiere of Raw. It didn't felt feel big. It didn't feel interesting. There wasn't anything really. There isn't anything to it any more than there has been any other week this year. And this week, WWE put their best foot forward. They gave you everything they had, both barrels. And like, we want this week is our chance to lure in all the fans that have left. Our chance to get back in the good graces of everyone that we've spurned of these last six months of god awful bullshit shows. And they delivered an eh show, an eh show, and a piece of shit rotten garbage show. So, yeah, let's go to uh, the Wednesday Night War. I watched these two simultaneously, but I just kind of ha- I was not really paying any attention to NXT. That was like on my smaller TV with the sound off. I was watching AEW and I thought AEW did a really I thought it was a strong premiere, not an amazing show, uh, not on the scale of that first Nitro. They didn't have a surprise on the scale of Lex Luger coming out. I had to kind of chuckle when Jack Swagger got the Lex Luger spot. Excuse me, I don't know who that is. I believe you mean Jake Hager. Jake Hager, yeah. <laughs> um, I was actually at that show. I, I drove sure. across country by train 14 hours to be uh, basically in the front row alongside the ramp for the show. Like, I... I don't know if you guys are really understanding of how all in I am on AEW at this point. Like the degree to which I went all in on Ring of Honor first and then Impact and then I I, I do this. I I go overboard. <laughs> so I'm fully all in. And I love the show. I did. I, I love the way it built one steady through line angle throughout the course of it. I love the way that they didn't blow everything they had in the first episode. They really only used like a couple of talents throughout I love the fact that they gave the women so much time and they really, like, tore the house down. Like, it, it was a good surprise at the end. It wasn't, like, like it wasn't the Lex Luger level surprise. But at least I love that they built a heel stable right off the bat and that that's what's going to drive their programming. They have all the right ideas. Uh, they're going to – they're going to stumble as they go because nobody who's running this company knows how to do this, really. But – I thought it was very strong for it was a lot more coherent than I expected it to be. Yeah. Uh, production was excellent. You know, really no flaws there. Good booking direction overall, some good matches and strong deserved rating. I'm going to be curious, you know, how much of their audience they retain uh, for it, this week. Yeah. 1.4. Very strong. Um, we, we, when we originally talked about what we were hoping that they would do, it was around a million. Like, they had to start yeah. at a million. Like, if it was less than that, that was going to be a big problem. To start at 1.4, good. Build on that. That's fantastic. But, like, you said that you had NXT on at the same time, and I get that. But, like, why the fuck would anyone watch NXT in comparison to this? Like, not that I'm the biggest mark for AEW of all time, but just, like, NXT, the TV show, like NXT, the weekly program has never been very good. It's just a vehicle to build to takeovers, which are very good. And these two hour long monstrosity NXTs are just not what anyone asked for. No, and really, this is like the worst time for NXT to get on TV since about 2014. They have less of a roster now, and they're starting to correct that, giving them Finn Balor. We'll see, you know, um, uh, Ciampa coming back. We'll kind of see who else they add, but their roster is real thin right now. They got about five guys. Yeah, and I understand what they're trying to do by bringing Finn. It, it, it's hard not to say bringing Finn down to NXT, because that's still what it feels like. Even if you try to call it a third brand, it feels like a step down for Finn. Yeah. And then, um, you know, moving on to SmackDown on Friday, 
a pretty good show. I very low. I mean, like they really did. They put everybody on there. They, this was a total crossover show. They had all the raw guys on there. They had the rock. They didn't have Steve Austin or the undertaker who they advertised. This is a very annoying habit of WWE that they just constantly advertise things that don't actually happen. Yeah, they realize they can just get away with that, that they can just yeah. say anybody's coming and then they don't and nobody says anything. Yeah, like when Sid no showed the Raw reunion. That, okay, but I'm still hot about that. Like, that, I still hold that against them. How how dare you promise me, Sid, you fucks. But, yeah, I mean, the big developments, um, you know, uh, Shane McMahon being fired. I honestly was, I, I was expecting Owens to lose, and I thought Owens was going to get moved to NXT. I was Pretty surprised to see Shane lose. Yeah, that kind of reconfigures their whole, like, who's in charge of that show now, and, like, that whole... It's interesting. Yeah, I'll be interested to see if they have a new authority figure. Is it going to be Triple H? Is it going to be, you know, Edge? Is it going to be somebody else? The draft picks. That's, I don't even know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> who's going to be drafting? Not, neither Raw or SmackDown really has anybody in charge of them right now. Might as well just make it Heyman and Bischoff, right? I would I would totally do that. I mean, they like subtly acknowledge that like Bischoff is in charge of SmackDown on like the Raw reunion earlier. He was talking about signing somebody. That's pretty interesting. I think um, it was Mar- I think it was Maria, which of course yeah. was yeah, of course. Yeah, because what there's a wife swapping angle. Eric Bischoff's got to be part be of it. The center of that brother. Uh, let's see, what else did they do? Well, they started an angle with a notorious homophobe and woman beater, Tyson Fury. Yeah. Huh. That's real special, real psyched about that bullshit. Yeah, uh, the Enochiism is strong here, is it not? Look, I, I went on a big tangent about this on Twitter yesterday, and I I don't know how many of you guys out there really know or care what Enochiism is, And I could go on for three hours about this, and we're not going to drag it out that long. But just understand that WWE is currently engaging in exactly the same thing that New Japan did in the late 90s, early 1000s, that not only killed, almost killed New Japan, but killed MMA, and almost killed professional wrestling in the country of Japan. So that's where we are with that. Yeah, not great. No. Not ideal. Um... I guess the other big thing, Brock Lesnar beats Kofi Kingston in about 10 seconds to win the WWE title. You know, tough end for Kofi's title reign. Kofi deserved better. Kofi Kofi deserved better the entire time he was champion. I mean, Kofi's a very good man who deserved good things. I, yeah, I wouldn't. I, I'm fine with the match being short, but I would have given it at least three minutes. Let Kofi get some stuff in. If I thought that Kofi was going to get a rematch, I would be fine with this, but I know that he won't, and that's why I'm not. You know, they're going to if they use this as an excuse for a rematch, that's awesome, but I don't think they will. And then the big stinger, Kane Velasquez, making his WWE debut. You know, big surprise, big star from the MMA world. You know, has made some waves wrestling down in Mexico, done some pretty awesome stuff, and. You know, we'll see where it goes from here, but the reports right now are his knees are in pretty rough shape and he may not be able to wrestle anytime soon or ever. Yeah, I'm not really sure. Like, we're recording this basically the same day that the news breaks that his knees are in really bad shape. So how bad shape they are, we don't know yet. So this is a little bit soon for us to really pass judgment on it. But it'll really suck if they went through all this pomp and circumstance to put over this feud and then we never get a match out of it. And even so, I mean, it's going to be on the Saudi show probably anyway, right? Like, hopefully he's healthy enough that they can get a match out of this sometime. If it's on the Saudi show, I'm never going to see it, so it doesn't really matter. But it does seem like Fox has either WWE used Fox to get to these other athletes or Fox asked them to do this. Because there really seems to be a very particular focus on, like, outside wrestling athletes, doesn't there? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just kind of the case. They don't have a lot of stars, so try to bring some guys in from other worlds and make them stars. And to me, 
it's a reasonable strategy. If Kane were healthy, I might just put the belt on him and be like, let's try to make this our top guy. Like, if he comes in and he beats Brock Lesnar, isn't this the man if we just present him as such? Yeah, honestly, too, like, Kane Velasquez, I know a lot of you guys probably haven't seen much of his work, but it's good. Like, he's... He's ready for prime time now. Like, you wouldn't necessarily think so, but he picked it up fast, like almost Kurt Angle fast. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, so that's SmackDown. Uh, Hell in a Cell on Sunday. Um, you know, I, <laughs> this is the thing. I thought it was a really good show until the main event. Like, yeah. I thought the undercard was really strong. And then, Becky and you know, Sasha tore the house down. Yeah. That should have yeah. been the main event, no question. That was great. I liked the tag match with uh, Roman and Brian teaming up. I liked Randy and Mustafa. Um, it was a lot then, of stuff that didn't really have any reason to exist. Well, no, they weren't there like two matches announced before the day of the show. Like the card all just rolled out like Sunday afternoon. Yeah, Randy, liter- Randy versus Mustafa Ali literally happened like on the way to the ring. It's like, all right, well, let's throw these guys in there. Randy hasn't won a match in, like, put him over somebody. And then the main event came. The main event. I mean, I we are huge fans of The Fiend Bray Wyatt. And yes. I cannot wrap my head around not only how they didn't put the belt on him, but how they had him get destroyed by Seth Rollins like this. You asked me the question over text, and you asked me, Is this the worst main event in the history of WWE? And I literally had to take like five minutes to think about it. Because in the moment, it felt like it, didn't it? It was really bad. Just why would you? I mean, look, Seth as champion has not been super over, has not moved. You know, ratings have been declining. I feel like he's lost a lot of momentum even in the last few weeks with how he's been presented in this feud with the Fiend, he was a perfect sacrificial lamb. This should have been Bray going over in like five minutes. And the crowd was absolutely responding to Bray every time he got on offense. They turned on Seth Rollins here. Yeah. Like, they were booing the hell out of him. And, like, it was not a heel turn. It was just, we want Bray. So they were mad every time Seth was on offense. I don't think... I know that WWE knows that it has something special with The Fiend, but I don't think they realized until after the match exactly what The Fiend seemed to represent to the fans in attendance. Hope. That, like, he represented the one thing they cared about, the one thing they had hope for. And then when, to the extent that, like, they liked Seth Rollins, they weren't booing him before he got in the ring, but, like, Fuck Seth Rollins. If he has to die for The Fiend to succeed, fuck him. Die. The Fiend is all we want. Yeah. And they uh, destroyed The Fiend in one night. And then they basically did, they just kind of ignored it on Raw, was the really amazing thing. Like, just kind of skipped over that that main event ever happened. I think they realized, and this isn't something WWE does very often. WWE is very insular. They genuinely, it has to be something big for them to realize they fucked up. And they very pretty clearly realized that they fucked up. And God. But now it's too late. It's too late. No. They ruined it. You can't come back from that. Yeah. So, I mean, overall, for WWE, where is this company going? And the shitter, but you know what? That's fine. A.W. all the way, baby. That's kind of how I feel at this point. I Look, like, everybody can like what they want, but I kind of can't wrap my head around people who, like, watch WWE all the time and really enjoy it. I know they're out there. I see them on Twitter. I read them on forums. I just don't get what people are into about this product at this point. Just understand this. WWE probably put on about two hours worth of quality programming this week. And AEW probably put on about an hour. Yeah, but that's the thing, is that WWE put on 12 hours of content, nine hours of which was them just repeatedly machine gun shooting themselves in the dick. And all AEW had to do was not suck. And they didn't. And right now, that's all it takes to be in the lead in this war. Yeah. Hmm. So we'll see where things go from here. I feel like, you know, just given that, you know, 
fun times we're living in, these little uh, check-ins with the modern product will become a more regular uh, feature of this show. But let's uh, get in the way back machine and go back to October of 1999, where we kind of finally catch back up with WCW. We haven't done like a WCW show from this era since uh, Starcade, where Goldberg got beat and lost the streak. I'll tell you what. We when we go back and revisit these WCW shows, and again, like I, I always feel the need to point out that I didn't watch any of this stuff at the time. This is just kind of like me reliving your childhood with you. <laughs> so it's kind of fun in that respect. I missed it I, when the second I heard Tony Schiavone's voice, I was like, "Oh man, we're right back here. This is so cool, Goldberg! Yay! All right, let's do it." And then the show happened. Ah. Uh... Yeah, this was a miserable show to watch. I I mean, the backstory of this show is Vince Russo jumped ship from the WWF kind of like mid-September, and they gave him a few weeks to, like, watch the show and learn their product, but they had him start as head writer, like, two weeks before this show, which I just find insane that you would start a new head writer that close to what's really your biggest show of the year. Yeah, we've mentioned before that, like, Star or Starcade is considered the biggest show. It's not, though. It never really has been. It's not uh, since, Halloween, like, 1985. Yeah. Yeah, and Halloween Havoc was the one that always seemed to get the sponsorships. It always had yeah. the biggest main events. The Slim best Jim, set. Snickers. Yeah, like, that was this was their – this and, like, Bash at the Beach were their two biggest shows. But uh, I always think – I think of Halloween Havoc as number one from, like, 95 on. Yeah, absolutely. And, like – this feels like it, too, like in a lot of ways. And it's just such a baffling decision. Like, Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff just took over Raw and SmackDown, right? But they yeah. took it over in, like, the middle of the summer, so they'd have time to get their bearings before it mattered. Imagine if Paul Heyman was handed Raw two weeks before WrestleMania. Yeah. It's like, what the fuck? No! Yeah, like, and it's just... You're stuck finishing up somebody else's storylines. Like, there's yes. not much you can do with that. You can't. You, so it's he's writing somebody else's stories, but like putting his like Vince Russo style on it. Which this is a big adjustment they're having to make to like the Russo Crash TV style. I mean, WCW, of course, while they had become more like promo oriented done more out-of-ring segments, you know, in the late 90s. This was still much more of a traditional wrestling show with a traditional wrestling format that was focused on in-ring action, did not do a lot of backstage segments, and that's 180 degrees removed from how Vince Russo does a wrestling show. Yeah, it's it's actually, you can definitely tell the moments on this show that Vince Russo specifically shoved in here that, like, weren't, things that he inherited from somebody else because there's still that feel of like 1997 WCW and some of these segments. And then they're just surrounded on all sides by these bizarre, like 30 second backstage segments or these like weird in ring promos that make no sense. Like you can tell where the Vince Russo starts and stops. Yeah. I mean, so to kind of the lead up here, I mean the months and months before this, it's just a mess. The world title is changing hands every month. Guys are changing face and heel with kind of no rhyme or reason for it. You know, uh, they do a very poorly executed double turn at Uncensored where Hogan starts to turn face and Flair starts to turn heel kind of before they've laid any of the groundwork for it. Uh, Kevin Nash books himself to win back the title. They turn DDP heel like a week after he wins the belt as a face at Spring Stampede. Randy Savage wins the belt, loses it to Hogan the next night on Nitro. And then we come to August, where they're searching for a spark, and they play one of the only cards they've got in their deck on the August 9th Nitro. Hulk Hogan goes back to the red and yellow with no real build to it. Now, would you have put him back in the red and yellow at all, or just... Yes. Yeah, I would have gone there, but I think you needed to build... I think there was a way to do this where, like, Hogan tries to be a good guy, but nobody trusts him, and, like, he walks out, and then, like, things are dark for WCW, the heels are beating up everybody in the ring. Like, Hogan's been gone for a little while, and then, like... 
the red and yellow music comes on and Hogan comes out to save the day. Like, I think you could build a satisfying storyline and like Hogan going back to, um, you know, the the Hulk Hogan persona is a big deal. It's a big card that you've got to play. Although, to be fair, he was never really that over in the red and yellow in WCW. Yeah, it's just those fans, and not to say that all WCW fans were just WCW fans, but, like, that hardcore fan base never really was all about the red and yellow. Like, they that wasn't for them. Like, you saw that when Hulk Hogan went back to WWE, and, like, that entire audience grew, who grew up with Hogan was like, yep, welcome back. We want the red and yellow now, please. But it's just a different audience. Yeah. So here's how it went down. On this nitro, I'm going to paint you a word picture for once. Yay! We got a bunch of wrestlers in the ring for a six-man tag match. Hogan's the last guy to enter. There's a long pause, and then American Maid starts to play. Tony Schiavone and Bobby Heenan are on commentary. They're confused. Heenan says they must have queued up the wrong music. But then Hogan comes out in the red and yellow gear to just an insane pop. Like, fans are marking out out like people are hanging from the rafters here they've got the pyro he's posing this crowd is rabid the roar just only grows and grows as he poses on the ramp makes his way down to the ring gets in the ring tears the shirt like it feels like 1985 all over again hulkamania is back if you didn't just like get like a chill up your spine here and that you must be dead even though i hate hulk hogan with all my passionate heart Fuck, that sounds great. It's a great moment. I watch that clip all the time. But, like, and that's just the power of this character in Hulk himself is that basically with, like, very little buildup, very little of anything to just produce a reaction like that out of nowhere. It just, But it makes you wonder, like, how much bigger it could have been if you had gotten real time on it, you know? Yeah. So at uh, Road Wild, uh, the main event was Hogan versus Nash in a retirement match. Hogan won. Uh, Believe it or not, Kevin Nash did not stay retired. What? Yeah. Swerve, bro. (laughs) Um, uh, Business is just kind of tanking at this point. Like, they have fallen so far. They've gone from doing, like... Nitro doing fours the year before this to now they're barely breaking like 3.0. Their pay-per-views are a disaster. They're losing money. Like Bischoff is flailing and coming up with kind of just like crazy ideas. Um, you know, million dollar giveaway on Nitro, sign Master P, bring back Dennis Rodman, uh, this New Year is evil, like Kiss concert slash pay-per-view on New Year's Eve. Have you heard about this? Yes. It's one of the stupidest things that I've ever heard in my entire life. And Eric Bischoff has such a blind spot for the idea that he might like something, but it's not popular with his audience. Like, just like Harley's kiss like his other favorite things now this is like not that crazy like kiss i feel like was kind of hot in 1999 right detroit rock city they had the yeah they had gone back to the face paint like i have a distinct memory of like i mean i was just learning who kiss was because i was a kid but i have a memory of kiss being kind of cool at that point but the idea of trying to do this massive pay-per-view on new year's eve like with the Y2K thing in a football stadium and it's half kiss concert, half wrestling show. It's way out there. And he's just throwing money in the garbage. Like even if any of these are good ideas, even if any of them like do hit to any respect, it's still, none of these are going to be long-term solutions to any of the problems that you're having. And you're just throwing so much of Ted Turner's money at everything. So, very abruptly, the decision is made. They need to make a change, and they remove Eric Bischoff as executive producer. I just, 
this is the guy who built WCW into an empire and they kind of fire him before they really give him a chance to pull out of things. Like, yeah, business is down, but still well above where it was a couple of years before this, much less where it was when he took over. Yeah, I really feel like the decision to take him out wasn't so much because they didn't have faith that he could pull the product around, but was more because the flailing seemed to indicate that he didn't really have a direction and he was just kind of like blowing a lot of money in a high profile way in a way that just didn't sit right with the higher ups. And that seems like more what it is, is that the Eric Bischoff that turned WCW around was in control. He had a plan. He knew where he wanted to go. This Eric Bischoff had no fucking idea where he was going. And I think I think he was just burned out. Like yeah. I mean, he'd been working an incredibly like high pressured stressful job for years at this point you know you've just been there where you're just done psychologically you just need a break he just needed some time and like had a conversation with harvey schiller where he like suggested he was going to resign and then like schiller like talked him out of it and then fired him the next day which boy i don't i don't understand why he didn't just like be like yeah eric i understand like you should resign yeah that's the way you feel like and just kind of a basic thing to me it's like if you don't want to be there you shouldn't be there now the more interesting thing to me because i understand the decision with bischoff and to some extent schiller probably thought like if we ever need him again we can go back to that right i think he just he needed a vacation yeah. he needed to go go off the grid go fly fishing and white which is what he did just went up to his cabin in wyoming and hung out there for a while but like Here's the thing, like, you don't necessarily need Bischoff in order to do the things that you're doing. Like, you have, like, I don't know if Kevin Sullivan still has the book at this point, but you have, like, a number of... It's a committee. It's uh, Kevin Nash, Dusty Rhodes, and Kevin Sullivan. Yeah. So you gotta, you basically have the booking committee in place. You don't necessarily need anybody to have that executive producer role. So I'm one, I have always wondered, like, who it was as a higher up that said, we need somebody to run this. Let's get – we need to take what WWF is doing to beat us and, like, steal one of their guys and put them in charge. Well, of course – I mean, you got to I, – I, of course you'd hire Vince Russo, given that he was available at this point. Like, I, it's kind of remarkable that he was available at all. We'll get into the story there. But, I mean, he's turned the WWF into a monster at this point. Like – He's the guy you're going to give credit to. He's the head writer. Like, it was not at all a wacky hire. It's At the time, it was a remarkable coup. was yes. like 100% the feeling was, oh, my God, they just got the guy who turned the WWF around. Like, he's going to do the same thing in WCW. But it turned out Russo was a one-hit wonder. And, like, some people have attempted to portray it as if, like, Vince was, like, wringing his hands happily, like – those fools didn't know that no. Vince Russo secretly sucks. It's not this was, like that. This was a crisis for the WWF. Yeah, this was chaos because he quit with no notice. They literally thought he was coming to Raw the next day, and Vince gets a call from Russo who tells him he's leaving for WCW. Yeah, Vince has literally never, ever, ever given as much leeway and like as much control over creative to an individual person as he did to Vince Russo. Like, basically, he and Vince Russo worked hand-in-hand to create everything. And, like, basically, Vince would write the entire script, hand it to McMahon, McMahon would make changes, that's what you'd see on TV. That doesn't happen. Even before when it was, like, Pat and Bruce sitting in the office, Vince was heavily involved in the actual creation of storylines. But here, like, he was on television so much, he was trusting Russo hugely to do most of the stuff. Like, it's... To the point where when Russo leaves, Vince basically says he'll never do it again. Like, Vince feels so betrayed by Russo leaving that he refuses to give anyone that level of power over his company ever again. It's always been a committee since then. And, like, Vince has easily hurt feelings. His feelings got hurt big time. Yeah. I mean, I think we've all kind of heard the story with Russo. He's burned out. He feels underappreciated. Uh, adding SmackDown has doubled his workload. Like he was already kind of felt like he was stretched thin having to write raw. Now he has to write another two hours of TV every week. Um, I mean, they gave him a raise. They hired some writing assistants to give him some help, but he's just 
feeling like he's at the end of his rope and he goes to Vince and kind of pours his heart out to him. And he's like, I don't know if I like, I'm really struggling with this. You know, I miss my family. I never see my kids. Like tells the story of like trying to take his kids to a movie, like on a Sunday or Saturday afternoon. And just like getting called by Vince, like while he's at the movie and having to like leave the movie to do this long call with Vince about what they're going to do on raw that week. And he just, Pours his heart out to Vince, and Vince is just like at his very coldest, and allegedly he's like, I pay you a lot of money. Why don't you just hire a nanny to take care of your kids? Which, oof, boy. It's like a yeah. top ten coldest shit you can possibly say to a person. But also, from Vince's point of view, that's literally what Vince's life has been Yeah. for 20 Vince years. Had, Vince never had a lot of time with his kids. No. He was working. He, he was brought his kids to, to provide work. for them. Yeah. yeah. He, that was how his kids got to spend time with him. He brought them to work for his company. It's and that's always been so fascinating to me. It's like I almost feel like Vince like left him like made himself Vince showed himself for who he is to Vince Russo. And in that moment, Vince Russo was like, Oh shit, I can't do this. Like I can't be that guy ever. No, 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 no. So that leads Russo to call J.J. Dillon, who's his former co-worker from the WWF. Um, it's a quick negotiation. They sealed the deal over the course of two days. And on October 3rd, Russo signs his contract and he calls Vince to let him know he's done effective immediately. Uh, just a stunning turn of events here. Now, just imagine that you're Vince McMahon and like literally like you have all this. You don't even aside from this conversation that we know about. He did not know that this was coming. Russo has made it very clear that McMahon thought that he was at the end of that conversation that Russo was in forever, in it to win it. Here we go. And to just be like, oh, no, that guy that you put all your trust in, that everything is built on, that you can't run your show without. Yeah, he's gone and he's just signed with the competition. Fuck. Yeah. Um. WCW, as we said, is in really rough shape. Uh, Fall Brawl in September, which was headlined by Hogan vs. Sting, who at Starcade 97 drew one of the biggest pay-per-view grosses of all time, did a .3 buy rate, which is like oh. one of the lowest pay-per-view buy rates ever to this point. Like, it's a stunning fall back to the kinds of buy rates they were doing like in the pre Bischoff days. That's so depressing. Like they got to fall so far, and for like Sting specifically to fall so far from where he had been to here, it's just deeply sad. Yeah, and this Hogan Sting storyline was actually, I think, really like intriguing and well done. Um, Lex Luger was telling Sting he couldn't trust Hogan. You know, Hogan's up to his old ways. He's gonna bring back the NWO. Like he's the guy who was driving the Hummer that hit Kevin Nash or whatever the hell that storyline was. Um, the tagline for the show was "Who do you trust?" And then they kind of pulled a Lex Luger to Tonka, and it turned out the guy we couldn't trust was Sting, who hit Luger over the head, or hit Hogan in the head with his baseball bat and knocked him out to win the title. And it's one of those things where this storyline has actually continued on in their careers. Yeah. Like, it extended on into TNA. One of the greatest storylines that TNA ever ran, ever, let me give them some brief props here for a second, is when Hulk Hogan comes in, and, like, he's all pomp and circumstance, and he's a big baby face, and he's going to save TNA. And Sting is dead set against it. Hulk Hogan will betray us. Hulk Hogan's not a yeah. hero. Like, he dons, like, this Joker face makeup and, like, goes back to the rafters and starts beating up people at random who are on Hogan's side. It's just like, you guys don't understand. Yeah. He's going to betray us again. And then, at Bound for Glory, Hulk Hogan betrays everyone again. <laughs> Yeah. Sting was yeah. right. I dig that. Yeah. Um, Sting as a heel is always an interesting thing to me. Didn't seem like he embraced it until TNA, really. And I think part of the reason it worked there was he like he knew the direction was ultimately he was going to be vindicated. 
Yeah, and, and part of the thing with Sting is like Sting towards the TNA part of his career really didn't give a shit about wrestling. He was just interested in acting opportunities. So any storyline he could do where he could like stretch his acting range was what he got passionate about. So Russo and Ferrara's first Nitro was October 18th. Uh, some notable stuff from that show. Buff Bagwell comes out for his match against La Parca, like with Boo Boo face, and he doesn't do any offensive moves. And then he just kind of lays down and gets pinned. And after the match, he turns to the camera and asks, did I do the job right? Uh, I mean, okay. I guess we have to talk about this because Vin- I have to assume that Vince Russo wanted to do this in WWE too, because he does it so quickly that it's very clear that this is something that he really wants to dig into. He loves, loves these work shoots. The idea that like, oh, this is actually, you know, predetermined, but sometimes the guys double cross each other. And yeah, this, this just becomes like the basis of how he writes in WCW. He thinks that people, or maybe he doesn't even think that people are interested. Maybe he's just interested and doesn't care. But he thinks that people will be fascinated by pulling back the curtain on wrestling. And in truth, people are fascinated by that. Dirt sheets make a very good living off of this exact thing. But what people don't want is that when they're watching wrestling, to have their suspension of disbelief shattered in front of them for no reason. And that's that's what Vince Russo does. Uh, Jeff Jarrett shows up, hits Bagwell with a guitar, and says that he's the new chosen one because he's the guy with the stroke. Um, again, alluding to the fact that he is actually a favorite of Vince Russo. And Russo and Ferrara were referenced on TV as like, we have new powers in charge of WCW, but thereafter they would just kind of be referred to as like, the powers that be. And eventually they started doing like, an Inspector Gadget type thing, or like a George Steinbrenner from Seinfeld thing where like you could see the back of the chair and it was Russo like giving directions to people, but you would never see his face. Now, do you think that that was supposed to be like kind of a reference to like Vince, like big man kind of being like the shadowy figure behind the scenes that made all the decisions, but you didn't really see it on TV or was this just really like Vince Russo wanting to make himself a super cool super villain? Well, I think there's sort of an idea here. I think it makes sense to, like, roll out a new authority figure for the new era of WCW, but I definitely would have done, like, a figurehead, like, you know, have a performer as the new president. I mean, I don't know necessarily know who it would be because you've kind of been through, like, Piper and Flair have done it already. Maybe Hogan, but Hogan's the champ. Well, Hogan's lost the title by now, but maybe you'd make Hogan the commissioner. I don't know, but... I don't mind the idea of having, like, a new authority figure to kind of emphasize this is a brand new era of WCW and we're changing direction. Agreed. I wouldn't have made it Vince Russo. That's That's pulling the curtain back too far. It damn sure can't be Vince Russo, because Vince Russo is not a good television character or personality. He's could just, you, Dustin, yeah. Dusty Rhodes could do it. Kevin Nash could do it. Kevin Nash is who I would personally have chosen. It's like Kevin Nash, giving him the opportunity to not have to work and just talk all the time. Yeah, yeah. big time. Um, uh, the, the headline match of that show, a great match between Sting and Bret Hart for the WCW title. It uh, looked like Hart had the match won until Luger interfered and hit him with Sting's bat. Uh, like, Luger and Sting have formed an alliance at this point. Their thing is kind of like, it's our time now. Like, it's time to get rid of, you know, Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan and all the old guys. Like, this is, you know, our time. It's our prime. Like, we're going to be the top guys now. I just love, that's the other thing, too, is that Luger and Sting's friendship is a through line that lasts, gosh, 20 years? Basically. It's just, it's fascinating that that stays a thing, is that whenever the chips are down, Luger and Sting have each other's backs and nobody else's. Uh, so the rating for that Nitro was way up from the previous week. It was up seven-tenths of a point to a 3.3. Can't call that anything but a smashing success. Absolutely. That's dynamite. Yeah. 
I mean, it's fair to point out that Nitro had kind of been in a holding pattern for the weeks before this as they were, you know, preparing for Russo to take over. But still, you know, combination of intrigue over the new writers and just kind of an improved, more interesting show, immediate success. On the other hand, they got totally smashed by Raw, which did a 5.39. But still, that's something to build on. And at this point, you're not going to compete with the juggernaut that is Raw. You're, try, you're trying to get back to, like, a four. You know, right. Raw is doing, like, fives and sixes. You're not at that level. It's going to take time. Yeah. Looking at it long term, if the if they never buy WCW and things just continue on, business slows down for, w, for WWE probably in 2001, right? Yeah. So, like, you only have to make it, like, two more years to have an opportunity to get back on even footing. Yeah, and then Raw's ratings collapse to the point where they're barely doing fours, and suddenly you're not that far behind them. And if WCW could have survived those couple years in the early 2000s where it was a really lean, tough TV market, and then they got into, like, the era of rights fees where you're actually getting paid to produce your show, that's a whole new world. Whole new world. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, how many guys, I mean, I've heard Jim Cornette talk about this all the time. Like, he's like, Smoky Mountain Wrestling would still be in business if they paid us to make the show instead of us having to buy TV time. Yep. Like, I mean, pretty much every revolution that was. Like, these days, God, what a fucking, yeah. like, promoters from the 90s must be so pissed when they hear that, like, anybody can get something on TV now. And they'll pay you for it. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas you had to buy the TV time, or at best you were just going to do a barter where, like, they'd give you the ad money. Yeah. Um, so some of Russo's, yeah. like, visions that he's talked about. Um, he, want, he said he wanted to have all the legends kind of get taken out by younger guys. Then they would kind of come back and band together like the Avengers. We never really see this play out because... You know, his run gets cut short. They would later do this in the spring of 2000 with uh, the New Blood and the Millionaires Club. The issue to me with this is, isn't the crowd going to be more inclined to cheer the old guys, but you really want to put the new guys over? So who's supposed to be the good guys and who's supposed to be the bad guys in that? I mean, we've seen a template for this succeed, and it's the Nexus, right? Is you call up a bunch of new guys. Would you call the Nexus a big success? It was until they fucked it up, yes. Yeah, like for a week. Be, it lasted at least three months as a success. Come on now. But what, about, uh, it, what about the main event Mafia in TNA? That felt like a better version of this. The problem with the main event Mafia is that the heel stable on top was an absolute smashing success, but they had nobody to wrestle because like the youth movement just wasn't there. And, like, that's kind of the case here, too, where you, like, you definitely got the millionaires. But who like, are the young guys? It's like, oh, DDP. Is DDP a young guy? DDP's, like, 40. Uh, Booker? They haven't been doing anything with Booker. Yeah, yeah they, don't, you, they just don't know. have a crew of guys to, you know, Benoit? Uh, not, the, not the guy I want as my main event guy at this point. Yeah, you can create a stable that works here. But, like, none of them are in the right place. So, basically, it's the revolution stable. You just add Booker T and take out Shane Douglas. Like, that's the stable, right? But, fuck, I... And they all leave, like, the next year. That's all your guys. Yeah. His other big thing was he wanted to vacate the world title so that he could do a tournament and then have Bret Hart win the title. What do you think of that? It's deeply, deeply stupid. I like the tournament because I think you can create a bunch of good storylines from that. I don't know about Bret Hart. Bret Hart at this point, I'm not feeling that. Here's I the thing. I don't think there was anything left in Bret. He was just kind of a shell of himself. Two different parts to this. Part one, the tournament. You like tournaments. I like tournaments. Wrestling fans like tournaments. You know who doesn't like tournaments? Actual fans. Yeah. Actual television viewers. They hate tournaments they're just ponderous and long and none of the matches matter until the last one and it doesn't work and as much as i hate hate that because i personally love tournaments they're so much fun i think vince mcmahon is kind of right about this one they're television poison they really are but putting the belt on bret hart 
like I get it, especially since like the last time Vince Russo had I, I got to keep saying the last names. The last time Russo had Bret Hart, like they made magic together, right? Yeah. Like I definitely see why he would want to put the belt back on Bret. And there's what? not a lot of other good options. What is Bret Hart's character at this point? Is he a face or a heel? He's turned so many times. He has no credibility. Yeah, it's actually genuinely very difficult to tell what the fuck his character is and supposed like, to be. They're pushing him as a face, but he's a whiny little bitch. Yeah. It's not good. It's not, And it's not like the way he was in WWE where he's like whining – but he kind of has a point, and, like, Canada has his back. In this case, nobody has his back. He's just annoying and shitty. It's not a great look. Yeah, so with all that, uh, we get to the show. It's Sunday, October 24th, 1999. We're at the MGM Grand Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, 8,464 fans in attendance. That's only, you know, half full it's a three hundred and twelve thousand dollar gate, which is not a bad gate number at all. Very expensive tickets here in Vegas. Um, does a point five two buy rate for about two hundred thirty thousand buys. That's pretty far down from Halloween Havoc the previous year, but up quite a bit from the previous month at Fall Brawl. So that's something. And let's also be clear: Halloween Havoc the previous year had Hulk Hogan versus the Ultimate Warrior on it, which, while a disaster, was a hell of a draw. Um, on commentary, Tony Schiavone and Bobby Heenan. Uh, what'd you think of them? Feel like they're missing Mike Tanay here? I do feel like they're missing Mike Tanay, but I really like these two together. And like, just having not a three man announce team feels so good. Like, it's to not three different people talking over each other all the time. A two man announce booth is so beautiful in its simplicity. And like, Tony seems so relaxed on this show. Like, usually he's very uptight on big shows. For some reason, like, he and Bobby are just, like, shooting the shit during most Does, of this show. Doesn't have Bischoff in his ear. Yeah, that must be what it is. It's like, nobody's telling him what to say. So Tony's just kind of like, oh, hey, that was pretty funny. Oh, hey, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, opening package goes over the Goldberg, Sid, and Sting Hogan issues. Uh, we cut into the arena. Loved this piece of music they were playing over the speakers here. Yes, like it very much, yes. Yeah. Um, we go to the announce desk where Shivani announces that Rey Mysterio is hurt and cannot compete tonight. Uh, him and Conan are stripped of the tag titles, but there will be a triple threat match between Harlem Heat, the First Family, and uh, Conan and Kidman for the vacant belts. And then we go straight into our Cruiserweight Championship match as Disco Inferno takes on Lash LaRue. Lash? Okay. Tell me, you were somebody who, were you watching, you were watching during this time too, right? Yeah, not as much, think, but. What did you think of Lash LaRue? I, he's just nothing. He's nobody. I remember there were some rumors he was going to play Gambit in the X-Men movie, which some other time we could talk about how insane it is that Gambit has like never been in any of the X-Men movies for some very strange reason. That'll be our fifth podcast, uh, movie 90s comics podcast. Fuck yeah, dude, don't even joke with me. Come on. Do a 16-hour episode on the Clone Saga. I could do, literally, I could start talking right now and keep talking until I died of dehydration just about Gambit in the 90s. Uh, yeah, Lash LaRue is just the epitome of a guy. Like, he's just an enhancement talent. I don't really know why he's having a match on their biggest show of the year out of all the guys on this roster. And like, this seems to me like something that I brought up when we were talking earlier, which is Vince Russo has no idea how to pick stars. Like, no, it seems like every time he looks at a guy and thinks that's a guy who can make money, he's always every single time wrong. And, like, I don't know for sure that he's the one who decided that Lash LaRue should be on this show. I have no idea. But I do know that Lash LaRue gets an inordinate amount of TV time over the next six months to a year. And it doesn't make any sense because he's nothing from – I'm so sorry, Lash LaRue, if you're out there listening to this. But you are nothing from nowhere and are not interesting here. How super fly did Disco look in his fur vest and cowboy hat during his entrance here? Can I just say that, like – 
I felt very weird about this, and I just want to air it out now because I feel like of all the bad times we buried Disco Inferno, and I know you never have. I love I have, Disco Inferno. I buried him many times. Um, God, he's looking great here, man. He's yeah. in like he's ripped to shreds. Awesome yeah, it's crazy. Um, it's not much of a match. Disco gets an eye poke and a DDT. Larue does the splits and hits a clothesline. Uh, he hits a splash, but Disco gets to the ropes. The announcers are completely ignoring the match to talk yeah. about the main event matches. Disco tries for the last dance, which is a stunner, but LaRue blocks that, hits a backbreaker. Uh, Disco comes back with a spinning neckbreaker. They exchange moves until Disco hits the last dance for a pin. Nothing special there. After the match, LaRue attacks Disco and hits like a pile driver type move onto the belt. Setting up who knows what. I gotta say, like, Disco looks like he's got something here. Like, he's in great shape. I don't know that the cruiserweight division is necessarily the right place for him. I'd probably have him be the TV champion instead. Yeah, but just, it must be said, like, he's he's got something. He's in great shape. He's His work is the best that it ever was. Like, there's something here. Like, maybe he's part of your new your stable of like new guys who are kind of fresh. I think you have to move him away from the disco inferno gimmick, but I mean, maybe that's just me. Uh, They show Chris Benoit and Dean Malenko arriving at the arena. Saturn comes out to ask them why they haven't called him back. And uh, Benoit and Malenko say that they're done with the revolution, which has been their their stable of young guys, Benoit, Malenko, Saturn and Shane Douglas. Yeah, how does the revolution get going? Like, what are they the revolution against? Is is this just like the early? Like, it's just like we're we're young guys. We've been held down, so we've got each other's back. It's time for change around here. That makes sense. And like, yeah, it, it's funny that this stable basically includes all of the radicals. You just switch out Shane Douglas for Eddie yeah. Guerrero, and then they end up like evolving them into like kind of like anti like an anti government militia. That's that, Russo's influence. Yeah, it's not good. That doesn't seem great, no. Um, next, we've got uh, Mike Tenay interviewing Harlem Heat. Uh, they lost the tag titles on Monday to Rey Mysterio and Kidman. <laughs> Stevie Ray busts out the iconic term, fruit booties, yes. to describe the filthy animals. <laughs> I can't say that out loud without laughing. Fruit like the- booty. This is not the only time that he utters those magical words. That Um, becomes his thing. Yeah. Because, like, how do you not pop for fruit booty? It's just... It's iconic. Imagine... Just just for one second, imagine you're a big, tough guy, and you're cutting a promo about how you're about to beat somebody's ass, and the worst thing that you can think to call them is a fruit booty. Like... That delights me on such a fundamental level. I just, I love it so much. Booker says that they grew up whooping punk asses in the street. That's, I mean, kind of. <laughs> I mean, not totally wrong. Uh, then we've got a uh, Falls Count Anywhere street fight for the tag titles. We've got the first family, which is uh, Brian Nobbs and Hugh Morris. What a team. Managed by Jimmy Hart. Who all is in the first family? I think it's just these two guys. Maybe they have somebody else. I don't know if Sags is around at this point. Because that's the shittiest tag team Bad tag I team. can possibly think of. Just no. No, no, no. Uh, Harlem Heat and uh, the Filthy Animals with uh, Kidman teaming up with Conan to fill in for Rey Mysterio. Um, Kidman and Mysterio beat Harlem Heats for the belt belts on Nitro. Don't really know if Mysterio's injury is legit or if they just wanted to hold the titles up to do it. Yeah, he's definitely not on this show at all, so it might very well be legit. Yeah. Um, uh, here's I'm gonna make a genuine effort to say nice things about this product during the course of this show because we could just shit on any show. You already knew this show was bad when you clicked on the play link, right? Like you didn't need us to tell you that a show booked by Vince Russo and WCW in 1999 was garbage 
on top of garbage in a garbage pile. Like, that's not what we're here for. So I'm going to try to say some nice things. The filthy animals are cool as shit. Like, that's a good idea for a stable. Take Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero and Conan and also Billy Kidman and put them in a stable and just let them be cool. That's a good idea. Yeah, no complaints about the filthy animals. Yeah, it's just like it's Los Guerreros as a stable, and I love it. And like them versus Harlem Heat, fuck yeah, I'll pay you money to see that. I do not need the first family. Uh, this immediately spills out to the floor and into the crowd. Lots of trash cans, trash can lids, kind of the usual hardcore stuff. Uh, they fight up the ramp and on the stage, like into the graveyard. Uh, the match kind of splits up into two matches. Harlem Heat fights with Knobs backstage in the ring. Uh, Hugh Morris sets up Conan on a table, hits his no laughing matter loss or um, moonsault, which is ridiculously impressive to see yes. a guy that size doing a moonsault. For sure. Does that on Conan through a table, but we cut backstage where Harlem Heat has knocked out knobs and they cover him to get the pin. I did like the element of having like two different referees here so they could have the match split off. It just seemed logical. Is that something they did often? Because they kind of treat it like, just like always, we have two referees for a hardcore match. Yeah, this is the only time I ever remember it. Okay, just checking. Uh, Yeah, kind of a messy match, but you know, did what it needed to. Yeah, again, like there's nothing that's wrong with this match that couldn't be fixed by just not having the first family in it. But it's fine for what it is. Does Conan's injury at the end, is that real? Does he actually hurt? Couldn't tell you. I, I'm thinking that it's not because of, like, they kind of play into Eddie Guerrero being abandoned on his own and stuff like that. But, like, they kind of make it look compellingly like Conan really is hurt. It's like, oh, shit, that sucks. And then DDP and Kimberly come out. Oh, my uh, God. Kimberly gets on the mic and says that, 14 times isn't just the number of times Ric Flair's been the world champion. It's also the number of times he smacked her butt last week. Uh, Why they run an angle where, like, I think she was trying to seduce David to mess with Rick, and he showed up to the hotel room and, like, grabbed her and spanked her. Yes, yeah, she, he was, she was going to, like, drug him and, like, embarrass him and something like that. But instead, an incredibly horny Ric Flair showed up and said, the kid couldn't make it, so I'm here, which is Woo! very, that's very alarming that, like, Ric Flair just thinks that that's how relationships with his son work. Yeah. Like, just the idea that, like, David Flair legitimately dated Stacey Keebler and that, like, at some point, Ric Flair just busted Woo! into their hotel room like, I'm tagging in, kid! Wearing the robe and nothing else. It's, uh... Uh, I, gotta she that? I gotta say something nice. Kimberly here looks oh boy unreal. She looks yeah. so good. It, it's and every time she stands next to Diamond Dallas Page, who looks like I don't know, like somebody's like hard smoking grandmother put on a velvet shirt. Like it's it's real apparent how attractive she is. Oh, she says that when she's with DDP 14 times is just a little warm up. She then gives the audience a lecture on consent, explaining that when she's with DDP, it's OK if he spanks her. But when Flair does it, it's a bad thing. And she's right. Yes. What a hero that she here is explaining consent to all of these uncultured swine. I am 100 percent on her side. Which, of course, makes her a huge heel. Gigantic heel. No. Consent. Boo. Then Paige gets on the mic. He takes off his belt and challenges Flair to a strap match tonight. So okay. that's on. You're actually doing him a great service by saying he takes off his belt. Because he takes a solid two minutes to remove his belt. <laughs> cannot get, it's a weird-looking belt. He cannot get this thing off. He's, like, knotted a strap like around his waist like five times and he just can't pull it off and he's trying to stall for time and the only thing he can think to say is whack it like i'm gonna whack you like to whack it flair i'm gonna whack you you like to whack it whack it 
keeps... Um, there's just 150 masturbation references in a row, and that's all this segment is. I wonder who wrote this. Yeah, I wonder who. It's a mystery. Then Mike Tanay interviews Eddie Guerrero, who says not to worry about Conan, and he shows off the gold Rolex that he stole from Ric Flair on Nitro. Now, this is one thing that I find genuinely interesting about this show, is that throughout the course of this night, there are multiple storylines going on for basically everyone on the show. That's interesting. I like that. That's something that Vince Russo, that's also Vince Russo, but, and that's the best of Vince Russo. Yeah, that's a strength. The yeah, way Vince Russo weaves and stories and put them together and interesting things can happen. Yeah, so like Ric Flair is feuding with all of the filthy animals and also Diamond Dallas Page. And that's very cool. Like, I like that a lot. It creates a through line through the whole show that's really interesting and builds to the matches later. Like, I like it. Like, that's another compliment that I can give. Good job. And then we've got Perry Saturn versus Eddie Guerrero. Um, great match up there. This match rules. Yeah, it's everything you want it to be. Yeah. Eddie gets hit with a hot shot, like, right off the bell. I think this is sort of a heel versus heel match. Eddie definitely seems like a heel. Um, Perry Saturn, a heel. Yeah, Saturn has gone heel as, like, the revolution has split up. Um, Saturn catches Eddie with a big T-bone suplex. Eddie gets Saturn in an armbar, but Saturn lifts him and slams him. Uh, Saturn hits a springboard moonsault. Beautiful. Uh, he goes up and does another moonsault, but Eddie gets his knees up. Eddie goes for the frog splash, but he misses. Uh, Saturn goes for another springboard, but Eddie catches him with a drop kick. Eddie charges Saturn in the corner. He gets lifted and dropped into the turnbuckle. Eddie fights him off. He goes up top, gets hit with a super kick. Saturn sets up for Splash Mountain, but Eddie slips out of it and hits a superplex. Ric Flair comes down the aisle with a crowbar and attacks Eddie, and we've got a DQ. All I could think of the whole time that Ric Flair is using this crowbar, which he does for most of the night, is that they will eventually have a guy named yes. Crowbar that does this the, stuff for Flair. Every time they reference the crowbar, I thought they were talking about uh, what what was the what's that guy's name? Devin Storm. Devin Storm. That's right. It's just so funny to me that like that's going to be his role is to assault people for Flair, to be his crowbar. Flair just loves a crowbar. Um, Kidman comes down. He gets hit with the crowbar too. Tori Wilson comes down. Flair teases he's going to hit her with the crowbar, but instead he just gyrates and then he grabs her and kisses her. Rick Dirty Flair. old rapist Ric Flair. Ric Flair has a mating dance, which is not unlike the Peacock of the Witherwell, which is he just begins to strut wildly and dance around her. And since she did not leave, that apparently means consent to Ric Flair. And then he plants a really gross old man kiss on her. And then she pretends to like it because that's her job. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen. This is this is the life that we're all leading, where we have to talk about a casual sexual assault committed for goofs by a baby face. Hooray. Flair goes to the announce table and gets his Rolex back. Uh, we go backstage where there's a brawl between Goldberg and Sid. Goldberg pummels him and Sid comes up bleeding. This was actually interesting. I can't ever remember a match like that was this hot where like before the match happens, they like get their hands on each other for an extended period. And then just like Sid just gets busted all the way the oh. fuck open. This is, yeah, he is covered in blood. It's it's really interesting. And, like, literally the, the talking point coming out of it is, like, are we even going to have this match? Uh, Buff Bagwell comes down to the ring to do a promo. He says he's got a problem with the new writers from up north, and he's got a problem with Jeff Jarrett. He calls Jarrett out. Jarrett rushes to the ring. Bagwell hits him with three clotheslines and then sends him to the floor. They brawl on the floor and then back into the ring. Luger comes down. He tries to hit Jarrett with the guitar, but he misses and hits Bagwell. 
But he doesn't hit him with the body of the guitar. He instead beans him with the neck, which seems like it would really hurt. With the neck? Ugh. Like, it, it just looked like a concussion. Like, oh, that looks painful. Uh, backstage, Mike Tenay tries to get a word with Sid, who sends him packing. Then we see Eddie Guerrero, like, sprawled out in a stairwell in pain. He calls Rey Mysterio, telling him he needs to get to the arena. I loved this. Yes, I loved it very much. Like, just like poor sad Eddie Guerrero in the stairwell, like, dude, Ray, you gotta come help me, man. Is it so? Ric Flair beat us all up. <laughs> Next up, we've got Brad Armstrong versus Berlin. I want you to say that full oh. sentence again. Next up, we've got Brad Armstrong versus Berlin. Somebody wrote that on a fucking booking sheet for the biggest show of the year. Yeah, let's get Brad Armstrong his big win over hated heel Berlin. Great. Oh. So Berlin is Alex Wright with, like, a goth gimmick. He's got, like, a black mohawk and piercings and I don't know what. Kind of looks like Aiden English, doesn't he? Yeah, kind of a lot, yeah. Except without any of the talent. Look, this isn't, like, the worst idea in the world. Like, Alex Wright doesn't suck. But it's just, like, no charisma to it. This is an enhancement match, and Berlin loses. Yes, Berlin loses clean to Brad Armstrong. So also, Berlin has the wall, but Berlin and the wall. What a combo. Yeah. Uh, the also, wall looks like a taller version of Scott Steiner. Also, do you did you catch where Berlin is announced as being from? No. It's Berlin. Oh, clever. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, Hogan saw the wall backstage and was like, ooh, make some money with him, brother. And he eventually tries to, and one of the funniest <laughs> segments in WCW. That's history. the wall! That's the wall, brother! It's the wall! <laughs> He's like ten miles away on a rooftop. You can't even see him. <laughs> oh. These guys are both really good, technically sound workers, but nobody cares about this match. Imagine being able to care about this match. Imagine being like a member of their family who is able to care. There's a lot of Armstrong, so there is that. <sighs> yeah, Brad Armstrong never had any charisma, and like Berlin is trying to learn how to work this character. Like, I, I do see a, a version of events where Berlin is a thing that works, but it's not going to happen under these circumstances, that's I, for sure. I feel like Berlin should be the manager and the wall should be the wrestler. Right? Like, why isn't the wall just murdering Brad Armstrong here? Armstrong wins with a roll-up. Uh, the crowd pops huge for it, to their credit. It was a big surprise. That's, I guess, the whole purpose of the match. Right. It's just like, oh, hey, good for him. He got it. And then they just kill him after the match. Yeah, then he gets beaten up by the wall in Berlin. That was his fate. <laughs> um, Mike Tenay interviews Ric Flair, who rips on the filthy animals in DDP, and he says that Kimberly wanted to take a ride on Space Mountain last week. This is the most woos I've ever heard in any Ric Flair promo. A lot of woos. Like, in place of saying fuck, he says woo. So he's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to woo Kimberly, and woo, we're going to woo! Next up, TV title match. Chris Benoit defends against Rick Steiner. This match, it really struck me while I was watching this match how much it felt like a current day Brock Lesnar match. Rick Steiner Uh, doesn't sell shit. Yeah, Rick Steiner sells nothing. Does just like nasty suplex after nasty suplex to Benoit. And just like kind of wanders around smiling, like having a good time. Like it really felt like Oh, shit, this is exactly like like Brock Lesnar, just chilling, having a good time, killing somebody. Benoit hits a super Frankensteiner early in the match, and Steiner just kind of no-sells it, just gets right back up. I mean, you can't use the Frankensteiner on Steiner. <laughs> Benoit follows up with a suicide dive to the floor. Steiner hits him with a mule kick to take over. 
Uh, Steiner gets Benoit up for a power bomb. I think Benoit is supposed to counter this into a sunset flip, but they screw it up and Steiner just kind of drops him. He just falls down. It's kind of ugly. Uh, Steiner hits some huge German suplexes. Uh, Benoit gets a desperation DDT and then a clothesline. Uh, Benoit goes for another clothesline, but Steiner pulls the referee in front, so we get a ref bump. Uh, Steiner comes into the ring with a chair. He gets caught with a T-bone suplex. Benoit hands Steiner the chair and punches it into his face. Love that. Uh, Benoit goes to the top for the diving headbutt, but Steiner throws the chair into his face from the ground. Uh, Malenko runs down. He gets the chair, turns on Benoit, hits him with it. Malenko wakes up the ref, throws him into the ring, and that's all she wrote. Rick Steiner wins the TV title. I mean, this is a good segment. Like, this is solid, classic wrestling booking. Everything in it was good. Like, it's kind of amazing they didn't do more with Rick Steiner during this period. Because, like, he's one of the few credible people they have. Um, Malenko and Saturn embrace in the aisle and give a shout-out to Shane Douglas. Makes a lot of sense to put Benoit against the revolution, kind of making him a man, fighting a cause, I think is something that you can get over. I mean, Chris Benoit does get over over the course of the next few months. Like, that's that's definitely something that Russo makes a priority of his, and it works. Like, he, he does. Yeah, it they just start works. having him wrestle tons of long matches, multiple matches on a lot of shows. He, they get him over just enough that Vince wants him, and then he bolts. <laughs> Uh, Mike Tanay gets a word with Bret Hart backstage. Tanay asks Bret about being attacked by Luger with a baseball bat on Nitro. Bret says he's not 100%, but he's got the fans behind him, and that's all that counts, and he promises to excellently execute Luger. That's about as babyface a promo as you can possibly deliver. And yet it just doesn't feel right, right? Doesn't doesn't seem like he has his convictions. He's just already so obviously checked out, isn't he? He He just doesn't care about this. He's just collecting his paycheck, his very large paycheck. Yep. Uh, Then we've got Lex Luger billed as simply the total package uh, managed by Elizabeth against Bret Hart. Luger is in maybe the best shape of his career here. He's in, like, creepy shape. Like, you know that shape? that like bodybuilders get into where they're like every single muscle on their body is defined and you can pick it out. And it's like, Oh my God, like what the fuck humans aren't meant to look like this. That's where he is right here. Like, but like the biggest problem with a lot of bodybuilders and the reason that they don't work as wrestlers is that they, they don't have any mobility. Like they they don't train for that. And yet like Luger's not any worse a worker now than he was at any point during his career. Like that's pretty impressive. Hart limps to the ring. Uh, they fight on the floor immediately. It's kind of a plotting brawl with Hart in control. Hart starts working through the five moves of Doom and then goes for the sharpshooter, but Luger rakes his eyes. Uh, Luger starts working on Hart's injured ankle, gets him in a single leg crab, and Hart submits. Uh I mean, uh, not really the ending I was expecting here because it's very psychologically sound that Luger just picked apart Hart's injured body part and Hart had to tap out when he was caught in a submission hold. You definitely don't think that you're going to watch a Bret Hart match against Lex Luger and see Lex Luger be the excellence of execution. But yeah, that is what happened here. That is what happened. I mean, it's not a bad match either. It's not great. Um, it's it, made okay. sen- it made sense for Luger to win. You're pushing Luger and Sting as you know the big bad heels. Brett's got an injury. It's a good excuse for him to take the lo- take the loss. It is very much a bummer that like very soon after this, Lex Luger is going to be basically what just in a tag team with Buff Bagwell all the time. Totally buff. Also, it's ridiculous that we're referring to him as Lex Luger, because not one fucking time on this broadcast do they refer to him as Lex Luger. We get to hear over and over and over again, the total package. They also put him and Flair together and call them Team Package. Of course they do. Get it? 
Mike Tanay interviews Goldberg. Goldberg says he's paid to kick ass, and tonight he's going to separate Sid's head from the rest of his body. This is the perfect Goldberg promo. It lasts 10 seconds, it's very clear and to the point, and then he walks away. Perfect. All you need. Uh, Medusa comes out in a bikini. She's got a bottle of nitro cologne. Heenan keeps going on about how terrible it smells, and then Medusa gets on the mic, complains about having to shill the cologne, and sprays Heenan with it. This is one of those very wonderful moments of Bobby Heenan is a secret feminist, where like she's like, it's ridiculous that I gotta wear this bikini, and Bobby Heenan's like, yeah, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous what they make you do for a paycheck, isn't it? Man, that's horrible. <laughs> I bet your paycheck is less than the man's. Yeah, like, literally, like, Bobby Heenan saying all the right things. Bless you, Bobby Heenan. (sighs) Then they do a quick video package for Sting versus Hogan, and we've got our WCW world title match. Sting defends against Hulk Hogan. Hogan's music plays, but he doesn't come out. You can already smell the swerve coming, right? Yeah, just like, I never... I know what happened on this show before I watched it. I know I come in blind to most of these shows, but this is a very famous moment in wrestling history. And even so, as it started to unfold, like I, I was like, this isn't like what, what the fuck is this? Like, what is going to happen? What is the point of what we're watching right now? How this many goes, times did they do this lay down bullshit? I just like, it became so cliched. Hulk Hogan doesn't even come to the ring for like ten minutes. Yeah. It's his full entrance, the full recording of American Made, which is a terrible theme song. <laughs> He's American Made. And then Sting's full entrance, and then yeah. American Made in its entirety again. Hogan, yeah, so on commentary, he didn't speculate in that Hogan is arguing with the powers that be. He pulled rank, said he wanted to make the second entrance. They don't do the, like, oh, I bet he doesn't want to do the job here, but that's implied. Yes, that's very much implied. Yeah. Sting comes down. Hogan's music plays again. After a really long time, he finally comes out. He's wearing street clothes. He just walks straight to the ring, stone-faced, no posing, no playing to the crowd. Hogan gets into the ring and lays down, and Sting covers him for the one, two, three, and they you know, do an abrupt cutaway like it wasn't supposed to happen. Okay. So let's, let's play a little game, Steve. You're Vince Russo. Explain to me why you do this. Bro, bro, bro. What would happen if this was real? Hogan doesn't want to do the job, but he has to. So he's just going to lay down and everybody's going to think, oh, Hogan didn't want to do the job. He just laid down for him. It's going to be great. I, Man, I, I'm just yeah, this, my... was, this was their way of writing. Hogan's gone for a long time after this. I don't know what we don't see Hogan again like until the spring. It's just I don't I don't really know what the point was. Just to be to swerve to be intriguing. It's kind of intriguing because you've never really seen anything quite like this before. I mean, I guess the thing is, Buff Bagwell laid down for La Park on Raw, which is a really dumb thing to do when you're going to do that on your pay-per-view and your world title match. But right. there's no particular explanation for why Hogan lays down for Sting here. It's just one of those things where the fans were kind of into this. The fans were, like, excited they were going to get a title match, Hulk Hogan versus Sting. And then they just match. there's still residual, you know, importance to that feud. Yeah, and they just get brutally fucked out of that. And I don't know if Why that's not just give them a match. Like it doesn't have to be a long match. It could be five minutes, but give them a match and have Luger dick over Hogan. Like you could even do this same storyline by just having Hulk come out and like seem to like listlessly like not be giving his one hundred percent. Like, and like Sting takes advantage of it and beats him, and the yeah. announcers are like, "Man, that just didn't seem like the usual you know, Hulk Hogan." Didn't have his heart in it tonight. Yeah, 
yeah, what's going on with Hulk? That just that wasn't the Hulk we know. And that's it. That's all you need to do it like this. You're you're shining a light onto the part of the business that people don't want to see. And I can only imagine that part of this is that Hogan really didn't want to do the job and that maybe this is just Russo getting frustrated and being like, bro, this is how we solve the problem for everybody and we figure it out down the line. And this is how they get to do the kind of impromptu Sting Goldberg match at the end of the night, which is how they're going to vacate the title. Yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> they go right to the package for Goldberg versus Sid, and we've got a U.S. title match as Sid defends against Goldberg. Sid has a really weird entrance theme. It's like a very 80s rock song. Yeah, it's like really cheerful. Like, I wasn't really expecting that at all. Uh, okay, let's let's just real quick, too. This is another good thing. Throughout the course of this show, all of these Sid and Goldberg segments have been getting big reactions this from the crowd. This is hot. Crowd. Yeah. Like, and when Sid comes out here, he gets noise. Not just like boos, not just cheers, but just like the crowd is loud because they're all interested. You know that just sort of – that ambient noise when everyone's really locked in and interested and buzzing about the match to come? That's this. They want to see this match. They have succeeded – and selling a match that people actually care about. That's awesome. Yeah, two big bad dudes going at it. I mean, I wanted to see this match. I'm like, oh shit, Sid versus Goldberg. This match is going to suck, but I really want to see it. Uh, Goldberg gets his long entrance walk from backstage with the police escort. Always love that touch. It's just... Arguably the best entrance in the history of wrestling. That and, like, The Undertaker. Uh, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash jump Goldberg in the aisle, but security clears them out. Then Goldberg and Sid get into it. Uh, Goldberg drops Sid across the railing and slams him into the steps. Sid's cut is opened back up. He gets the advantage and locks on a camel clutch. Goldberg powers out of that, like, gets Sid up on his back and slams him. Uh, they exchange punches and kicks. Sid kind of works as a face here as he keeps popping back up after Goldberg knocks him down. It's actually kind of fascinating the way they lay this out. Because basically, like, Gold or Sid should not be wrestling this match. Like, he got fucked up so bad earlier that he's, like, not physically up to dealing with Goldberg here. Like, they kind of dr- drill that home. So Goldberg just keeps beating his ass, and Sid won't stay down. Yeah, I don't know if this was supposed to be a double turn or if it was just supposed to turn Sid face, but seemed to succeed. It kind of turned Sid face. I mean, obviously, on the law cast, Psycho Sid is a face 100% of the time. We stand Sid. If we ever put out a t-shirt, it would just be Sid and he would sue us. The Sid (laughs) cast. The Sid cast. 5,000. Not working title. They're doing a great job of like making Sid seem interesting and compelling, like like a like a badass who won't stay down, even in the face of obviously like the most destructive force in wrestling at this point, Goldberg. Like Goldberg's gonna win this match, but Sid won't stay down. Sid keeps fighting, but the referee stops the match and awards it to Goldberg. Sid still wants to fight. Rick Steiner comes down to the ring and restrains Sid. Tries to get Sid to leave. Sid keeps trying to get back into the ring, but he's ultimately kind of dragged away by Steiner and security. This is a great way for this match to end because it absolutely builds to a sequel, right? Like, we saw, like, it was... Sid took everything Goldberg had, and he didn't get beat. Yeah, you didn't pin him. You didn't make him submit. You didn't get squashed like everyone else Goldberg squashes. It was a stoppage. And Sid got right back up. Like, boom. Like, at that point, you pencil this in for Starcade, right? Definitely. Like, Sid Goldberg, too. You have to. Like, that's... It's a gimme. Two months from now, we're doing this again. They replay the Ric Flair-Kimberly incident from Monday. And then Sting's music plays, and he comes down to the ring. He grabs the mic, says he came to Las Vegas to fight... He issues an open challenge for the title, says he's coming back out after this match and he'll take on anybody who wants a title shot. 
Sting so, Sting is an idiot. I mean, even pseudo heel Sting is just one of the stupidest baby faces of all time. What are you thinking? Who come do you on, think man. was gonna come out? Uh, next, we've got the strap match: Ric Flair against DDP. Uh, Page is out first with Kimberly. Flair is solo. Uh, they are strapped together. Beyond that, the rules are not explained. Um, didn't seem like it was one of those strap matches where you have to touch the corners. I don't think so, because the match is won not by doing that. It did. Uh, they fight up the aisle into the crowd. Uh, they go back over the railing. Page is getting in some really stiff shots with the strap to Flair. Massive welt on Flair's chest uh, from the strap. These matches had to be terrible to wrestle. God, and Flair wrestled so many of them in his career. Like, it's just his... like, I'm sure they choose, like, leather that's been treated to make, like, the loudest sound possible. But at the end of the day, you're just getting hit with a big leather belt. Like, yeah. it's going to hurt. I mean, it's not going to feel great, <laughs> no matter how you try to tamper with it. Uh, Flair blades really gushing everywhere. Page just wears Flair out with the strap. There's no offense from Flair here. Um, Page goes up to the top rope. Or, well, Flair manages to like straddle Page with the strap, crotch him, and then works on his legs. Flair gets the figure four and also chokes Page with the strap. Page manages to break out. He wraps the strap around Flair's neck and hits the diamond cutter. Very awkward pin count by Charles Robinson. Not entirely clear if this was actually supposed to be the finish. Yeah, he definitely seemed like he was not sure he was supposed to be doing it. Yeah, I don't know if it's just supposed to be more like uh, work shoot bro stuff or if it was an actual miscommunication. That's the, the Vince Russo promise. You'll never be sure. Page hits another diamond cutter after the match. He then chokes Flair with the strap. Uh, David Flair runs down to make the save with a crowbar. Kimberly kicks him in the nuts and hands the crowbar to Page. Page hits a brutal low blow with the crowbar. And then Flair is stretched out after the match. Um, when they get him to the back, the filthy animals jump out of the ambulance and attack him. They throw him in the ambulance and drive him off. I believe the night after this is when they bury him out in the desert on Nitro. I mean, that's real fucking stupid. But I love the idea of all of Flair's bullshit from the whole night, where Flair was this top dude, he's on top of the world, he runs shit, he does what he wants, it all comes home to roost at the same time. Gets his ass kicked here. Yes. Like, he gets destroyed. Like, his it's dick gets it's beat smashed. off. Yeah. <laughs> All the and people then, who hate him most in the world drive him away into the night. Yeah. Um, so next up, Sting comes down. He reiterates he wants a fight. And Goldberg's music hits. And Goldberg accepts the challenge. And the crowd goes nuts. <laughs> yeah. Impromptu title match. Sting defends against Goldberg. Good job, Sting. And Sting gets demolished. Yeah. Goldberg kicks his ass all over the ring. Sting does hit a spear, but Goldberg just pops right up and hits a spin kick. Goldberg goes for the spear. He misses and hits the post. Sting hits three Stinger splashes, but as he sets up for another one, Goldberg explodes out of the corner with the spear, hits the jackhammer, one, two, three, Goldberg is the champion. God, that's, it's a good moment to end the show on, but it's also a deeply, deeply confusing one, isn't it? We just had this title match. Sting is allowed to make his own title matches. And, like, Sting, why? Why have you done this thing to yourself? Yeah, completely fucked yourself over here. And he'll try to explain on TV that, like, hey, uh, I didn't say it was a title match. I just meant it was a normal match. And everyone's like, shut up, Sting. <laughs> yeah. Sting, after the match, hits Charles Robinson with the Scorpion Death Drop, and the show very abruptly goes off the air. They just kind of smash to black. 
Yeah, I've never seen that before. Like, I know that they had stopped doing like just like the credits and everything at the end of the show, but it was very bizarre just to see it like them like run off the air. Like, oh, yeah. we gotta get out of here. I don't know if this was clipped for the network or anything like that, but it was very just like just straight to black in a way you didn't normally see. And I guess that the idea for from Vince Russo is let's make sure they're talking about us at the end of the show. Like, no matter how good it is, no matter how bad it is, all I want is to make sure that at the end of the show, they're, ch- like, talking to their friends about what happened on WCW. And in that respect, they probably did a good job. Like, I, I definitely would have, like, I, I, the equivalent of texting you and being like, God damn, did you see that WCW show? What the fuck was that about? So this whole scenario was just so they could vacate the title. Um you know, it was not an officially sanctioned title match, so Goldberg's not really the champion. But Sting, you know, got beat here and attacked a referee, so he's stripped of the title. And they decide to have a 32-man tournament for the WCW title that will culminate at the Mayhem pay-per-view in November. And I believe in the first round or two of this tournament, they had... The titles on the line, the other titles were on the line if you were a champion and in the tournament. Let's be clear about one thing. WCW Mayhem 1999 is the review that killed Kush Reviews. It was the review that I could not get through. It is like 37 segments of the most mind-numbing horror. And yes, it does involve the United States Championship being on the line, the television title being on the line. There's a separate tournament on the same show for the tag titles and the hardcore title. I, I it, It's a show, like, I attempted to review it in its entirety, and I got halfway through the show, and my review was 19 pages oh. because of every segment on that show. And I literally just looked at it and was like, I would rather never write another review than finish this one. And you never have. And I never have, except I'm now going to have to because Mr. Alistair Payton on Twitter has donated $20 to our Patreon and would like me to review WWE Evolution. So I will be reviving yeah, Kush Reviews. That's a fun one. Yeah, absolutely. If you would like me to do Kush Reviews, I swear to God I'll do any show that's ever been recorded except for WCW Mayhem 1999. Just kick us $20 and it's all yours. So, yeah, I don't know what to say about that show other than it was not good. I, what did you come out of this show intrigued by? Sid is kind of the one thing that stands out is Sid is a real monster and him and Goldberg would be interesting to see happen again. Yeah, I know that it's so us to say that Sid was the best part of a show and that that might dilute your understanding of how genuinely good that he was on this show. But Sid is the standout here, like Sid being a match for Goldberg. We finally found a match for Goldberg, somebody who can go toe to toe with him. And now Goldberg has the world title. And Sid is arguably the number one contender. Like, that's interesting. Like, if if you're going to have this 32-man tournament, like, I would say that it shouldn't have been for the title. Let Goldberg keep the belt. Let Sid win the tournament. And then at Starcade, there you go. Like, because that you have money in Sid versus Goldberg. Genuine, awesome money. Yeah, I mean, a rocky start to the Vince Russo era of WCW, and it won't get better from here. Um, yeah. you know, let, let, let me make it clear, if I didn't make it clear enough. Everything that Vince Russo touched on this show was disgusting, despicable, and horrible. His, his The stink of his hand on this show is telltale at every turn. It's such a cliche to talk about Vince McMahon being his filter. And I guess I've sort of rejected that because I've pointed out how many awful, like terrible things made it on WWF TV in the late nineties. But you just do see all of his worst excesses on this show on full display. I really, the way that I've always felt the narrative goes, and maybe this is just my head canon. I don't know that this is the case, but I almost feel like there's like a book of ideas he had that Vince always said no to. 
And that now that he's come here, he opens that book up and says, finally, yeah, we're finally I get to do the storyline where they all lay down and pin each other. Yeah. And it's horrible. Yeah. It's just horrible. There's a reason Vince said no to those storylines. Vince McMahon often doesn't know a good storyline from a bad one, as evidenced by Hell in a Cell. But goddamn, if he could smell a truly horrible promotion sinking idea a mile away. And Vince Russo goes from genius to fired in a space of about three months. Imagine how quick, like it, this is some of the fastest anyone's ever destroyed their legacy ever what's, in any business. What's a good a sports equivalent would be if like the Cowboys stole Sean McVay away from the Rams yeah. And then they started, you know, oh and five and fired him after five weeks. Yeah, and they got blown out by fifty every game. If he's they bring him in and he's just like, We're gonna run the ball eighty five times a game and everyone's like, Wait, what? That's, <laughs> That's not what we signed genius? up for. Oh man. I mean it's so easy to just look at Vince Russo as the buffoon that he's been exposed as at this point, but Understand that in 1999, this was unquestionably one of the best minds in professional wrestling. The man who we viewed as being responsible for the Attitude Era and the WBF's incredible turnaround and their unprecedented success. And I mean, I'll do you one better. I think that this could have worked. I think that there had to have been a way for Vince Russo to make this work. And it's it's a shame that this is the version that we get because this isn't the version that works. But he needed God. more time and less. He needed somebody to like. He just needs somebody to rein him in and to not have to come in under this much pressure. Yeah. Like we mentioned that off the top, but that can't be understated. Is to come in with all of this pomp. I've said pomp and circumstance like 17 times on the podcast today, but like, yeah, but like all of this hype, all of this celebration, all of this thinking that like, this is the guy who's going to save us. That's so much pressure. And then just be given like, here's a hundred million dollars and free reign of a wrestling show. Paint whatever you want is too much freedom for anyone. And you're going to take over two weeks before our biggest show of the year yeah. and have to totally overhaul this product. I mean, this is not a show that was heavy before on pre-tapes or long scripted interviews. Everybody's having to learn how to do a totally different style of wrestling here. Yeah. And, like, not only is there nobody to tell you no, but there's, like, everyone above you doesn't even know if you're doing a bad job or not until the money doesn't come in. So, like, those three months, like, nobody's like, hey, you need to course correct this. That's not really working right there. There's none of that. Nobody knows. Because it's run by a corporation that doesn't understand wrestling. At the end of the day, that was always WCW's biggest failing, and it always caught up to them. So, yeah, that's a wrap on Halloween Havoc 99, a, an appropriately disastrous start to the Vince Russo era. A really, really bad show here. Yep, it was real, real bad. It was coming out of this, I guess there was some intrigue. Wow, Goldberg's the champion, but I don't know where you would have. It's hard to go. There's not a lot of places to go with Goldberg as champion, as we have kind of established with how his first title reign went. I think... He had some money in a Goldberg Sting rematch at Starcade was probably just the direction they should have gone in. Yeah, just like finding a collection of dudes that look kind of threatening to Goldberg is, I guess, where you go, but you can't keep the belt on him. Yeah. Scott Steiner wasn't on this show. I don't know what he was up to at this point. Lifting weights. <laughs> yeah. That is one thing that W that's the one kind of bright spot of this late WCW is Scott Steiner becoming a superstar. Thank God he did because without him and Booker T and unfortunately Jeff Jarrett there, I don't even know what they would have put on television the last two years. So yeah, final thoughts on this show. 
it was real, real trash, and I'll thank you never to make me do this again. Irredeemable garbage. <laughs> Next time, we're going to have a show that's a mix of irredeemable, irredeemable garbage and some really good stuff. When we take on Halloween Havoc 1998, Hogan Warrior 2. How, 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 how have we never done Hogan Warrior 2? How? One of the true worst matches of all time. But not just the worst match of all time. A bafflingly intricate series of failures. Just stacking one on top of the other until the demise of all that is good and good, perfect in this world comes to pass. And a great world title match between Goldberg and DDP. Yeah. One of my favorites. Honestly, cements DDP as one of the great carry artists in the history of wrestling. Oh, it's an all-timer. Yep. Probably Goldberg's best match. I don't think it's even up for debate. I don't no. even know what else would compete with it. The Jerry Flynn matches. Okay, yeah. God, that's a throwback to early, early Lawcast, is us raving about the Jerry Flynn matches. Uh, also on the card, uh, the Outsiders explode as Scott Hall and Kevin Nash go at it. Sting versus Bret Hart and... Lots of other wacky WCW 1998 stuff. All that and more next time on The Lawcast.